Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very third episode of the Cloud Chasers podcast. Uh, I'm doing the intro this time. I'm Harawe, and I'm always joined by Christian Churla. Uh, for today's episode, we have a few different topics prepared because we actually got some uh, <clears throat> questions that we'll go over in the later part of the podcast. Uh, but naturally, the main topic will still be the the very, very rich with content weekend we had uh, regarding Wolverhampton. Um, so uh, it's going to be a very um, interesting story time. I can guarantee that, yeah. Uh, in any case, you might have already picked up on it. Uh, we are both still a bit under the weather, like uh, a Definitely. bit sickly. Uh, honestly, the weekend in Wolverhampton did not help. The English weather does not, uh, does not suit me, and obviously it was generally like stressful. So... Yeah, there have been better times. Uh, I imagine it's the same on your end, Christian. Uh, definitely. Uh, after this uh, turning period, we're entering a sl- uh, definitely a slower part in our uh, lives without any big tournaments to prep for. Uh, so we're most we'll be mostly f- focusing on content for our Patreon. We'll be writing guides and. Uh, Simply collecting our thoughts about uh, about the format. We'll be also doing a lot of prep work for uh, the new starter deck and the new mid set. I don't know how they even call it. Uh, the EDM. memorial collection. Yeah. 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 So uh, even though it's a quieter part of the year, there's still uh, a lot of work to do for for us uh, competitive players. Yeah, uh, like two main things that Christian forgot to mention that we will definitely be doing. Uh, first of all, uh, gameplay videos, because now we are both in Croatia for uh, uh, for a prolonged period of time, so we get to film those, and also the VOD reviews, because we, we did say we'll do those, and we're just waiting, because the Italian streamers, Christ wish they took down their VODs, so we're waiting for No Heroes to upload the rest of the matches to their YouTube, and then we'll, do, we'll, we'll go over them. Uh, yeah, you can expect that as soon as they appear on the No Heroes uh, channel. Okay, and with that, uh, let's start with our very first questions from the audience. Uh, let me check who uh, who gave us the um, the question so we can properly shout them out. Okay, so. The first question comes from Shacher, from our uh, Discord channel, and his question is, what is your opinion on trigger mechanics in the game? Uh, go first. <coughs> okay, yeah, it's appropriate I go first, I'm the one who, who gets uh, tilted by triggers more. Um, honestly, yeah, ever since the game began, it was one of those mechanics I liked the least in the game, especially because... When the game first started, there was no yellow, so any triggers in any color were even more of like a luck element because there was no life control to to utilize to, to you know get luckier with the triggers. It was just like you attack and they have Paradise Waterfall, and now your Versor is dead. Uh, Christian will know that well. He, I think he ate that three times in one final. Um, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, Which probably decided always... that game, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, Point being, now that yellow is in the game, honestly, yellow triggers are the least infuriating to me when they happen, just because the color is built around it, you know to expect them, you know how to play around them. The ones that I think still provide the worst element of uh, game design are the ones in colors which are not based on life control, where it's just like such a huge blowout if they get something really good. Like for example, and this was a very relevant in OPO5 format, Missile Sunday, Actually, it was just a free body that drew a card. Well, free, like minus one, one, whatever. Uh, and that effect was very overpowering and difficult to deal with because, like, purple Luffy could just go wider and wider. And there was also the uh, red purple Luffy having a bunch of ramp effects in his life. So if, if you just hit, he has only three lives. So in theory, he should have less chance to have triggers. But if he gets them, it's even more annoying because it was one of his three lives instead of five lives. And uh, the effect of uh, 
him getting ramp, but him ramping ahead of the curve is even more influential because he goes to his new gates, to his gear five, and so on. And I think the only time it will actually start being more and more problematic with yellow is if they go like the the good card design, where they make very specific triggers that are very powerful. Like uh, a good example of that is uh, you're the one who should disappear because it needs to be your uh, last life to get the effect. And this just puts it in a in a place where like, you know, this card sucks to have in life. It's like just a regular 2k, but then if it's specifically in the last life, it's way more powerful than it would otherwise be. And that's the kind of design I want to see less of. And I am concerned that we know there's a, a what's it called, Egghead Frankie coming in next set, which is like a 2k counter, which is already good. And then if it's the last, or if you have one or zero life, I'm not sure, he plays himself and draws a card. And he's a 5 cost 5k, I think. It's like that that type of design I think uh is something I hope to see less of in triggers because yeah it, it makes them even more like re it really funnels into that luck aspect, which I'm not a fan of in card games. Can I stand? Um let me first approach this as a with my other professional hat on. Uh let me talk about this mechanic as a game designer. As a game designer, I understand what they were going here. Um, it's a very exciting mechanic. As in, it's something unexpected, something to spice up uh, the gameplay. Because the natural curve of a One Piece game is, I wouldn't say predictable, but there's not a lot of unexpected stuff happening up until very late stages of the game. And also these triggers provide a, basically a comeback mechanic, as in you're losing, you're taking life. So that should be like, uh, the game considers you losing, and now you are getting something uh, in return. The problem is, are you really losing if you're taking life? And also it's a, it's a kind of randomness that we never like, I mean, me personally, in general in games, and um, especially in competitive card games. There... No, no, quick, quick tangent about game design. Uh, we usually talk about randomness coming in two types. Uh, we call them input and output randomness. Input randomness is a random event occurs, and after that you're making decisions. So a random event occurs, as in you draw cards, right? And then uh, you're deciding what to do with the cards. Uh, so you, first a random event happens, and then you're making decisions. But in but with triggers, your opponent makes a decision, and to attack you, you you're taking life, and the outcome of that decision is now uncertain. And that kind of takes away something we call player agency, as in your decision had its impact on the game lessened. If that makes sense. Um, so as a game designer, I understand why it's there, but personally, I don't like that style of design. As a competitive player, I've you just have to adapt to it. You play around it. But there are definitely games I lost to triggers, and that is not that's simply not not a good feeling. Um, because we do a lot of prep. This is basically our 
our job and to lose a game of One Piece in such a big tournament where you are just not allowed to lose to variants in big tournaments. You're basically allowed to very late losses. And getting a loss because of variants is very, very painful. We are not playing best of threes. We are not having any extra rounds, which I've been saying for ever since the beginning of um, One Piece that I'm baffled. Why are we playing the minimum amount of rounds needed in a tournament when while any other TCG is playing at least two or three additional rounds simply to account for variants. I have to do an actual here. Yu-Gi-Oh! also does a minimum number of rounds. Okay. So like uh, the, yeah, the, the two most popular ones, they do minimum number of rounds, which I guess is to, to shorten the tournament duration. But I agree. I mean, we'll sti- we're still... Most of us are there for two days. If they gave us two or three additional rounds, just to allow players to basically still show that they are the better players and not that they didn't get unlucky. And it also makes for a very bad experience as, as a player, because you know that if you lose one round, you're basically almost out of the tournament. Um, <clears throat> and... In Flesh and Blood, in Magic, like you can top while still having like three losses. Simply because of the fact that we're playing so many rounds, right? Yeah. And then one or two unlucky losses doesn't matter as long as you can uh, still perform. Of course, yeah, okay. the, the, the whole fact is j- the bigger the amount of rounds, as in the more uh, ran- it's called a uh, law of big numbers in mathematics. Basically, the more a random event happens, and the random event um, here being a game of One Piece, the more it converges to the expected uh, value, uh, and the expected value should be the better player winning. Therefore, the more rounds we have, the higher probability of actually better players placing. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, you, you really went off on a tangent here. Th- this is about completely. figures, just to remind you. Uh, for anyone interested in, uh, in, in actions of that, yeah, please uh, take a look at uh, probability and statistics. Anyways. Um, yeah, I guess I should add why I don't mind triggers as much in mm-hmm. yellow as in other uh, colors. Because I, I'm sure that that's the thing people hate the most. Like, oh, Yellow had big game life. They had the uh, Amaru in last life and so on. Uh, well, Yellow is designed with that in mind. A lot of its power budget for cards uh, is directly tied to the to the trigger text on the card. So, like, they tend to be very under... Like, they, they don't justify playing themselves from... Like, being played from hand for, for the actual cost as part of their balancing. Just because... Like, for example, Blocker Sanji, 4 cost 5k, Blocker, nothing else. You need to discard the card to play it. It's like, even as a trigger, it's not that fantastic. Uh, and any that are actually good, besides Pero Spero, uh, they, uh, they give up power elsewhere. Like, Kiku Nojo, obviously insane trigger to have. And you can play it from hand because it's vanilla stat line. But it's not searchable by, by Big Mom Pirates. It's not searchable by Skyline. It's only like Land of Wano searchable. And that has green searchers. It's probably the best uh, body trigger currently in the game. There, there will be better ones later. Uh, and it's probably the most infuriating one to face currently in the game as well. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't have any of the searchable tags, it doesn't have a counter, and so on. So like, you kind of know what you're dealing with. You just have to, I guess, hope that the deck you're actually playing has a way to deal with it. Uh, and uh, that there's also like Begay. Like, yeah, he, he's a 2k which is like the default include, he, he potentially stops lethals, but he's also not searchable by anything, he's like fire tank pirates or something useless like that. 
And it's just something you kind of try to play around and not put yourself in a position where, where you have to play around him. And as I said already, most bodies that need to discard the card, well, they, they just suck. Like, you don't want to play a Cracker from hand or a Sanji from hand or, or what is it, Smoothie, I think, from hand. Or Satori, like, you're never playing Satori from hand. Like, they're good from life. And they allow you to swarm board, play aggro, but they're, like, they're, that's trigger. The ability they can come out of life for without paying the, the don cost, uh, like, the card sucks as a result of it. And then when you play a game of 50 cards versus 50 cards, you have, like, a deck of 50 best cards for your color combination because that's what you want to run. And the yellow player, he has, like, 20 good cards and 30 cards, which are, like, yeah, this could be good in this spot if you know if it comes out of life, but if it's in hand, it's useless. Or like it has all the like effectively starter deck card applications. It's a two K. It's a it's a one K. It's it's not something they want to base their gameplay around, and that's yeah, why. Yeah, but I think that adds a lot of variance when playing versus yellow decks because sometimes they do draw the good cards and the bad cards, which have the triggers, are in life. And sometimes they draw the trigger cards, and the good cards are in line. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's that's probably the most infuriating aspect of facing yellow is when they high roll. It, do it doesn't really feel like a fair game, just because you know, on overall level, the yellow decks suck. Like they're not consistent. That there's a reason they don't perform. Okay, I guess that that's not true. They do perform at high level, but not in Europe. Like so, I'm throwing Shots shade to other regions maybe, but. Uh, yeah, I don't think Katakuri should be able to, especially in this meta, perform at a high level, and they'll even less so because, yes, black decks are just insane currently. I completely agree. Uh, I don't think he has the legs. Uh, I mean, I, I even think he struggles into Rager. So, like, the top three decks r have a quite a good matchup into, in, into Katakuri. So, anyways... Uh, all in all, triggers. Um. Yeah, as a verdict, I think the game would be better off without them. I I'm not too like uh, now that we've played with it, with them over for over a year. I don't mind that they're in the game. I just hope that their design doesn't go in the even sackier direction, like the egghead Frankie and whatever other cards may come out. But yeah, overall, uh, not the fan. That is the the same thing I, I was gonna say. I would. I'm not opposed to them. I would just like them to be properly priced, as in getting free bodies. Like, I think Kikinuju is really overstepping the line severely. Like, getting a free body is... and such a big body. I don't think that should be in the game. Okay. Uh... La the last question for today comes from Stanley. Uh, Stanley. Uh, also from our Discord, who asked us <clears throat> to comment on the tournament changes for this year uh, regarding the pricing, ways to qualify for Nets, and so forth. But what do you think about the tournament well, changes? Okay, I guess I'll outline the changes for anybody who's perhaps not following the events page as actively as we are. Uh, so obviously the first thing uh, that became aware, uh, that was like revealed to us, is that the price cards for regionals are instead of being top 64, top 32, and top 16 as the brackets, it's top 64, top 16, top 8. So like uh, if you want the the law uh, blocker, forecast, uh, that's a price card now in regionals. Uh, a year ago you would have to place in top 32, but now you have to place in top 16. And uh, in the same vein, for the Luffy, you need to place top 8 instead of top 16. Also, they made it so there is no limit for top 32. Uh, and uh, they generally made the event pack smaller, like for regionals. So the finalist pack and winner packs are smaller as a result too. Actually, I'm not even sure if the... Do they still have the winner packs? I just realized the... I'm not fully certain about that. Let me just look it up. Oh yeah, you do get it. You get a regional champion. Uh, but yeah, then they also made some changes for Treasure Cups. Uh, so first of all, uh, starting from the next wave in May, there's not going to be a serial card for top 8, which uh, I know that's that's quite a rough uh, uh, thing to take away. Because it, it, it's been like, I want to say, the centerpiece of uh, One Piece's 
pricing structure since its inception. Like, if you top eight, you get the cereal, and that's like the 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 rings in this game. That's what players count. Like, if you want to count rings, how many cereals do you have? And that's why some players, <coughs> excuse me, some players like uh, I don't know, Eric Quintana, Jackson Huang, uh, Giovanni, Salvatore, Salvatore Oliva. They were like have a ton of cereals. They are very highly accomplished, and that that's a way to showcase it. But now, if you get top eight, you don't really get to show it. And I guess it's similar to online regionals of the last year where only top two got the cereal. In any case, what they did replace well, replace them with is top two gets an uncut sheet of uh, currently OPO6. So I think it's nice that Banda is doing the progression. Like they're doing, they had the OPO5 uncut sheets for the finals. Now it's OPO6 uncut sheet. But yeah, it made the pricing uh, more top heavy. And also the the... The prize cards and treasure cups are also top 64, top 16, and top 8. And the final change for the structure of tournaments this year is they introduced the plan for qualifying for Worlds uh, over the course of the season. And just like last season, it's going to be in three waves. And after the first two waves, uh, there will be the first championship finals, uh, at least in Europe and North America. And then the third wave, and then the second championship finals for Europe and America, and the first one for... Latin America and Oceania. In addition, Americans will also have access to store regionals, which are going to be like uh, smaller events where first place still gets uh, gets the prize card. I think Katakuri is the one they announced for. Point being that uh, there will be more chances to qualify for Worlds, more chances to qualify for finals in the first place. Uh, and yeah, I think that summarizes the changes for this year. So, Christian, I think you can go over your opinions first and then I'll add on to them. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that pricing in One Piece is a very peculiar beast, as in in Flesh and Blood and Magic, cash pricing is a significant chunk of your uh, spoils of the tournament, and One Piece is different. One piece, you're getting the prize cards, and the value you get out of the tournament is the price of those prize cards. And those are relatively big, because the game is very collectible, and a lot of people... There's a, lot, there's a big demand, basically, for these prize cards. Now, whenever they change something... I often feel like it almost doesn't matter that much, as in, there was one part of, I don't know if, whether they were regionals or uh, or treasure cups, where they had Queen and Zora. Treasure cups. Uh, and it felt like, wow, that's so, the pricing is horrible. But it ended up being so that, sure, the you don't get as many cards or as many little trinkets and so forth. But because there were so many of these prize cards, they're still selling for quite a bit of them. Uh, the price on them is relatively high. What I'm trying to say is, if only the top 8 get the Kaido or whatever it is, then that Kaido is probably going to be close to a serial card in price. As in, for us competitive players, like, sure, the pictures on the cards change, but uh, the payout remains roughly the same, I think. Yeah, I guess the because double dipping changes because before it was like serial plus the top eight in Treasure Cups because the mm -hmm. the Zoro and now Monkey D. Luffy, they are, uh, they are top eight locked. But... Yeah, it also kind of was bad if you got ninth because I remember when I was ninth in uh, in May of twenty twenty three, I think, at the Raid and Trade Online Regional, I was I got ninth place. It's just Swiss. The difference between eighth and ninth is like the the serial Luffy, the first Treasure Cup Zoro, and yeah, that's like at the time it was like six or seven thousand euros. Did not feel good. All I got was an Uzop and a Chopper. So yeah, Which I guess there's no more bad. double dip. I mean, not not bad, but. When you know the tiebreakers. Uh, what I'm trying like to say is, is that 
at least historically <coughs> across this year, um, the what the pricing is has not affected the price of pricing as much, and therefore I'm 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 ambivalent on that. The difference is how top heavy it is now. Basically, up until now, if you got top eight, you're good. Now you have to be top two to be good. And probably the Anka cheats will be far more than the serial cards. But that I dislike. As in, we if you're taking this game seriously and you play in a lot of tournaments and you, you're doing it full time, you really want to as is everything uh, in life, you, you want to have a steady income, which means that you would like to How should I put it? Uh, you will not win every tournament. But sh if you're a good player, you will have a decent performance at most tournaments. And you would prefer if, though, if you can convert th those decent showings into decent earnings. And getting top 8 was achievable. Getting top two on a, any kind of week. consistent basis is is far harder. So what I'm trying to say is I dislike it being top heavy. All the other changes I I don't mind uh, because at the end of the day, uh, if there's less pricing. Then that means that that pricing is more exclusive and therefore more uh, valuable to collectors. For example, the uh, finalist cards from um, from the finals they're super expensive. But if you if I showed that card to you and I showed to you the finalist card from uh, any of the treasure cups or, or regionals, whichever one they give the finalist cards, you'll be hard pressed to find the difference. As in, the, the cards, by their rarity, by their exclusivity, they look the same. But the price is significantly different, as in, orders of magnitude different. Simply because of the fact that the top player or the finalist cards from the championships are so much rarer. So, all in all, once again, to reiterate, um, the pictures change, but the the value is the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding treasure cup, I actually have a few more thoughts, which are not entirely uh, price related. Mainly. Uh, we won't feel this immediately because the first wave of treasure cups with this structure is all online. Uh, but one thing that having a very strong top two prize does is it adds an incentive to finish playing the tournament. Because, I mean, treasure cup uh, Cretail in Paris was a very good example of this. As soon as it got top eight, I just dropped because there was a 3v3 on Sunday. And in 3v3, you can win the serial Luffy, you can win the the Zoro Chopper was a package. And I, I believe Matteo Longin of K2 did the same. Like As soon as we both got top 8, we just went to the judge table and dropped and went to play the 3v3. Because, like, why not? There, there's nothing to be gained once you once you like collect the bag in top 8. Because that's where the serial is, that's where the Zoro was. And now, having a strong top 2 prize, such as uh, Anka Cheat, uh, which will be very valuable and decently rare, I think... I think I counted 10 treasure cups, so 20 Anka cheats total for OPS 6 currently. Uh, now you have the incentive to actually finish playing the tournament, because I know some people want to do it regardless for the honor, for 
uh, for the bragging rights, for perhaps national pride, because I played against the winner of Cretail and in top 16 of uh, Euros, uh, it was Pierre Breu, and obviously a fantastic player, and we actually talked a bit about it, and he was like, oh, I, it, it didn't feel like, oh, right, that some of the players just dropped after, uh, after they won their top 16, but, like, simply the fact that the event was running parallel, offering Serie Wolfie meant, like, there's no reason to continue playing the the main event when you can go for the effectively bigger prize in the 3v3. And yeah, as I said, the first wave is all online, so this incentive does not exist. You're just playing for <clears throat> for the placement, as you would in any other tournament. Uh, but once we do get offline treasure cups, this should be a relevant factor. What I don't like, though, is did we really need to remove the cereal? Like, he, it could have just stayed. Like, it's, it would still be rewarding all the same, because... For Banda, it's just printing like extra 700 pieces of cardboard for the for the bunch of events. Well, whereas for the players, it's a very nice piece of prizing. But then you also get like a, something nice to play to because now there there's even more holes. Or I guess the same number of holes uh, in the tournament structure where you play a round of top cut and you're like, whether I win this one or not, it doesn't matter. Like top top. Uh, Eight is still going to be the same. You get top eight, whether you get top four or top eight doesn't matter because there's no upgrade in pricing. Yeah, uh, that's what I would like to see changed. As in, I still think that what the pricing is for me doesn't matter because it's gonna as long as it, is it as long as it has collector's value, whatever. What I really dislike is yeah, a lot of rounds mm, don't matter. For example, I I think I saw it. I, I think you get a dawn for top thirty two, which is like completely whatever. And then after you get top eight, the next two or three wins again don't matter. Two wins. So yeah, I would really like <clears throat> for every round to matter. Simply to to. To give players like a sense of uh, something to strive for, to to fine tune the the uh, the pricing that actually reflects your uh, your standing, because it might be a big difference, uh, especially if it's a huge tournament and we get a top sixty four cut. Getting top thirty two, it means you won one. Uh, best of three, and if you get almost nothing for that, I, I, I think it feels relatively bad. Yeah, one, one thing that is nice about the first three of Treasure Cups being online though is if you win the Anka Cheat, they're gonna ship it to your doors. And wh while it's very a uh, sweet, uh, sweet, what's the word for it? For, uh, like, it's a very sweet issue to have. To somehow travel with the Lanka cheat and keep it preserved because you know it's it's worth so much, uh, but it is a pain to travel with, and having yep, it shipped yep. to your doorstep much much nicer, much more preferable. Um, but yeah, famously you you had to. I don't want to talk take about the that. bus home, and not the tr not the train and uh, no, no, sorry not, not the plane because they wouldn't let you with the with the Anka cheat after the Europeans. So I don't know that you're intimately. Uh, aware yeah. of those issues. Yeah. Another thing that maybe it's a bit uh, what's the word I'm looking for controversial about the treasure cups is the top sixty four prize card is once again a reuse of uh, of a pre existing altar. Mm -hmm. So we already had that with uh, Marco in uh, in actually the last wave of treasure cups or or the last series like with it was Marco Queen Zoro. Now it's just uh, they're recycling the Yamato from OP01 for the alt art. And I mean, it, the card looks amazing like because the alt art is already so nice by default and now it has the the pretty border. But I'm not a fan of like uh, straight up copy-pasting the art from a pre-existing uh, card because like there's already so many amazing artists they hire for, for these cards. Like, hire another one. It's, it's not gonna be... Like, it adds more exclusivity it adds more uh, desire for the card when something actually new rather than uh, a fancier collector's piece of something that already exists. Because that's kind of 
in flesh and blood that's what they do like there is the cold foils and then for winning you have gold foils which are just the same except it has a gold border instead of the usual like silver tone one and that's not my favorite approach just because it feels like the same card it, it feels like a marginal rarity shift in a way um but yeah uh i guess the biggest change that we should have ac should actually talk about more is the qualifying structure for for finals and for worlds so i'm not actually sure if if in eu they're going to do qualifying to, to finals because last year they only did it for na and if you go to a regional page and find uh, I think the it still shows. Yeah, the, North America only. only. Yeah, so I guess it doesn't really matter for us. For for us again, it's going to be like who has the fastest finger to get their spot in championship finals. Which, by the way, blows. Like, I I do not like feel that 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 I should be in a position where I have to be the fastest clicker to end up uh, with a ticket for effectively. Coming back to Worlds, because I, I want to go back to Worlds, and obviously it's a goal for everybody else, but I, I may, might be entitled in thinking that uh, those who were already at Worlds should at least qualify for the finals by default, or something. Uh, or even just people who top, like, there, there should be an incentive extra to, to perform consistently, uh, instead of having to, like, uh, just wake up in time, set an alarm, spam the F5 button, because, once again... Joris, Joris Verhelst, the player who won Treasure Cup Hanover with Sakazuki in OPO5, I think a, probably one of the best players in OPO5 format. He just did not get a ticket for Utrecht and could not play the finals, which is in a way a tragedy, because I'm sure he would have done well. Uh, but yeah, I generally am a fan of two finals uh, over the course of the season. It reflects the Japanese uh, a system of qualifying more where they have like multiple stages and uh, all leading up to a big uh, nationals finish. There was some talks about Banda increasing the number of spots in next year's worlds. So, in an ideal world, it's like top two qualifies from each finals because if it's just top one, then not much has changed. It just made the the qualifying format even more stressful and uh, like cutthroat. But the fact that there are two finals, and if both provide the, the two spots that we already had, at least for Europe and NA, like the bigger Western regions, uh, I think it's a good system and uh, something I would like to see them improve upon. And the experiment with the store regionals in NA, where stores get to host like qualifiers to these championship finals, that I'm a very big fan of. Generally, I think a lot of the events provided to stores uh, as I run organized play for a store, Magic Moments, uh, they're not very enticing. Like People will still attend them because some of the promos in them end up being very valuable, and people just generally want to want any kind of extra special content. But something like uh, a store regional, where it's like a real proper taste of competitive play instead of just playing the Uta starter battle or the, the seal battle for the Sabo, this is like you know you need to be the best of the best in like the actual format that matters, the constructed. Uh, having an incentive for players to go and get a taste of that high competitive level play at your local level is already like so good. I want to see more incentives like that, and I want it to come to Europe as soon as possible. Um, I agree. Uh, I don't want to uh, take any more time. We we're, we're took a lot of time to answer the, uh, these questions, but they were quite intricate. I'll just say that, yeah, I uh, I was kind of baffled that only two players uh, from EU and NA uh, got to Worlds. I don't think that reflects the... basically the population uh, of the players uh, from those regions. And I also thought it's kind of funny that... The Worlds was basically a glorified Locals with only 16 players. So, um, I definitely uh, would like to see more players qualifying from, especially the two big regions. Uh, and also, yeah, having an additional finals is great. There's just one more big tournament uh, to play in. I guess as a sort of verdict, I think there's definitely some goods and some bads to these changes. Uh, 
generally I would say there's always room for improvement, but one that are still doing a very good job. I would say better job than most other uh, uh, companies that run TCG organized play. So, you know, I think we'll successfully live with it and keep playing. I think so too. Okay. And with that, uh, let's go to the main topic. And that being the story time of the weekend of hell. Uh, let me start first, because my story is shorter. So, we had a very rough week coming from um, Creveld, super tired, but we still prepared a lot. We were fine-tuning our lists and adapting to the meta after Creveld, especially with the improvements to Sakazuki's list. And the adaptations to Gikomori list. So we put a lot of time and effort. And after all, money into uh, planning um, the trip, right? And we are coming to the airport. There's huge uh, traffic jam. So almost everybody is uh, getting late. And there is an uh, inside joke of me uh, always being very nonchalant and just coming in the nick of time. Uh, and it was quite funny that I'm the one who's actually uh, coming on time this time. And I'm the first through security. And I'm moving to the gates. And because... <clears throat> so, so keep in mind, like we travel at least once a month, sometimes uh, multiple times a month. So this is basically just another day in the office for us, as in, we traveled so, so many times, I think people recognize me on the airport, because it, it, it's not that big airport uh, in Zagreb. And uh, I'm, we're very familiar with like all the proceedings. And especially for our NA listeners. So basically, in Europe, you have uh, what we call a Schengen zone. So basically, you can go everywhere with just your ID. Uh, and uh, that's what we got used to. However, we were flying to England, which is no longer part of the EU. And what I forgot, and I was very uh, rudely reminded is you need a passport to um, get to UK, which would be a problem if I didn't have a passport. However, I went to some uh, several uh, to uh, events in uh, America last year uh, for Flesh and Blood, so I have my passport. However, I didn't bring it because uh, we travel a lot, and I got so used to just traveling with my ID. So basically, yeah, with all the money spent, all the prep time, all like the emotional involvement to, yeah, we're going to a tournament. I get there, and I just bounce from the door. Yeah, so that's very, very emotionally, like... Um, Gut wrenching. I don't know what else to say. I was, I was pretty devastated. Um, I started looking at all my other options. All the other flights were super expensive, and um, there was also one additional factor. One of my good friends uh, was getting into a civic partnership. That's basically marriage. Le less than a marriage, but uh, basically getting married. And they needed a witness, and he asked me to be his witness and to in uh, England. That's that's the key yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. He, he he lives in London, uh, and he was like, "Well, you're going to be in London. Great." Also, he's bugging me a lot that I never visit him in London ever since he moved. Uh, and this was like a great opportunity for me to spend uh, 
some quality time with him and his uh, partner. And also to uh, be there for him for such a big occasion. And the, the flights just didn't work out. In the end, I'm like, okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet, spend a lot of money. And the moment I organize everything to be able to be on that flight, the flight gets unlisted. Which is extra devastating because I spend a lot of now effort and emotional like um, energy to be, okay, I'm not going. Okay, let's try to go. Okay, what can we sacrifice to go? Okay, let's do it. And then not be able to do it. So I get home, super bummed, uh, start working, because that relaxes me. And I still decide that I will just go uh, one of the next days to London to be with my friend. And then I wake up with a fever. And I feel horrible. And I definitely have to stay at home. So yeah, uh, in the end, I didn't go to London. I stayed home to recuperate. Uh, and um, I, I, yeah, I feel horrible. Uh, I wasn't there for my friends. Uh, the, these tournaments are basically a focal point uh, for us as players. We, like everything is, like currently our, our lives are basically uh, focused. They basically revolve around these tournaments. We we prepare for them. We um, plan around them. They are huge events for us, and uh, not being able to attend uh, hurts a lot. Okay, so that's my uh, England experience. Uh, how about you, Herva? England without England experience, yeah. So you would think like Christian had it really bad, and to be fair, he did have the worst of us all. But there were some moments, some moments during the trip where the rest of us Croatians who were who were going, which was Sandro, Juraj, and me, and who remembered to take a passport. Yeah. Um, so first things first, always carry your passport. It doesn't matter where you're traveling. Uh, it's just an extra uh, personal document. There's like zero downside to having it with you. I believe Christian will now never forget his passport anywhere he goes. Uh, because, yeah, this was a rough lesson. Uh, but, yeah, how did we travel to Wolverhampton? Well, for those who don't know, Wolverhampton is not very... It's not a particularly notable city in England. It sits somewhere near Liverpool and Manchester, like two hours away. And it's a pretty small town. Actually, the nearest big town is Birmingham, which has an airport. Uh, but due to limited connections from Croatia, uh, the available flight dates were either like super, super expensive because they were managed by like some luxury airlines or they were just like not feasible dates, like flying there on Saturday or on Sunday. Uh, so the way we decided to go about this trip is uh, through London. So fly to London on Friday and just uh, get to Wolverhampton however we can. Now the issue with that is, when you fly to London, unless you're going to London City Airport, you're not actually flying to London, you're flying to its periphery, so just by getting to like Stansted Airport, you're not in London and you still need to get to London to actually hop on some other form of transport to reach your destination. That usually means you board a, a coach, a bus, uh, which takes between one and two hours depending on traffic to get to to one of the London's uh, center places. So yeah, as soon as you're off the flight, you go to two hours on the bus. Not the most fun. And then we still need to get to Wolverhampton. So we board another bus from London to Birmingham, which is another three hours uh, on the road. And then when you get to Birmingham, you still need to get to Wolverhampton, or like to the place you're staying. In our case, it was... Uh, they, they have a very neat uh, public transport system. You just like... You can tap your credit card like contactless, contactless when you board the bus and you don't have to tap it when getting out. It just charges you for the trip two pounds, which is highly convenient. You don't have to like try and find tickets locally. 
or whatever you may have to do in other cities. So props to, to Birmingham and the surrounding cities for having such a system. But yeah, it was another like hour-ish of, uh, of riding on a bus. And then around 11 p.m. we finally arrived to our destination where our, where our stay is, uh, which is Dudley. It's like a, some half an hour from, uh, from the actual venue by bus, which was fine with us because the price was good. But why was the price good? We go there to the location and we see a Dudley Zoo. And next to it, a country martial arts club. We're like, what? We, we cannot sleep here. The, the, where, where's the rooms? We're like looking at the location marked on booking. Like, okay, must have been some error on the map. So we cross the road because we see there's a hotel of some sort. And we go and we talk to the nice man at the reception. Uh, like, a, I'm forgetting what the word for portier is on, uh, in English. But the guy who like watches the, the, the doors and lets people in, yeah. Um, and we talk to him and he tries to figure out if we have a booking with their place. Uh, we don't. Uh, so we call up a number on booking and we are answered by a voice machine, which to be fair at 11 p.m. might not even be unusual for a legit hotel. But uh, at this point it was becoming rather clear that uh, we got got and we will have to nag booking to get our money back. Uh, yeah, we got a scam listing, we then check the reviews. Uh, yeah, so we, the situation was we have to find uh, a place to stay at 11.30ish at night. And you know, it, at this point it might sound like, well, you just talk to a guy in a hotel, surely you can book a room there. But no, they don't have any rooms left. Uh, so we still cannot find a place <coughs> a place to stay there. And I really have uh, to emphasize, like, you're in a foreign country. It's almost midnight. And you just wanted to hop into your bed, sleep, because tomorrow's going to be a stressful day. You need to rest. And what happens is you get there, there is no bed. And now you're in a very stressful situation. You have to find a place to stay. Like I was uh, unironically considering just offering the guy some money that he, to let us sleep in the lobby. But yeah, we, we did solve the issue. Uh, I went on booking looked around a bit and there was luckily nearby a hotel uh like basically five or ten minutes down the road that had rooms available and somehow it was cheaper than both the hotel that was that had all its rooms filled and the scam listing i have no idea how it was cheaper than the scam listing but we called the number listed on booking and a nice lady answered and we got there in like 10 minutes or i did the booking over over the website, because I'm pretty sure the walk-in fees, like if you try to walk in and book a room, it's decently more expensive. Point being, we did end up getting a room. We were very hungry, though. Like, uh, it was all the time uh, that we could have spent, like, finding food, eating, and just uh, enjoying ourselves when to trying to find a place to stay for the night. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we get to our room. Finally, we are super tired, and we're, like, considering when do we get to the venue tomorrow? I'm thinking, you know, we should probably get there at 9, just to be safe, to, like, have time to submit deck lists, find everything, find a place to eat, because we didn't really get to eat much. But my friends are like, nah, nah, it starts at 10, I, we just want to sleep, like, who cares? And, you know, that part starts at 10 is somewhat important. I didn't doubt it, and there's a good reason I didn't doubt it, deck list submissions were I mean, open that's, until... I think that that's also one of our big takeaways from, from this tournament, like, we kind of got used to playing in tournaments. We got used to traveling and how we travel. We got used to tournaments starting at 10 a.m. Yeah. However, um, however uh, actually, let me do it in order. Why did I not doubt that statement? Well, first of all, tournaments always start at 10 a.m. on day one in continental Europe. And when you think about it, if you like ignore the time zones in UK, it also starts at the same time. It's like 9 a.m. UK is 10 a.m. Central uh, Continental Europe. But uh, yeah, the deckless submission was open until 9 a.m., which is also the standard in, in Europe. And you know, it makes sense. Like one hour until before the event starts, you have to lock in the list. So like if the, if the lists are until 9 a.m., obviously the tournament is going to start at 10 a.m. 
So yeah, we wake up in the morning, a shower. We don't really get anything to eat. We just head straight to venue. Uh, I'm doing like some last fiddling with the deck list at like 8.55 on the bus. As I said, it's like a 30-ish, maybe more, 40-ish minute ride on a bus with uh, one overlay. Or is that the word? It's not the overlay, right? Okay. okay. In any case, uh, a few minutes later, like 9.04, a friend looks at the phone like, oh, there's wrong, wrong one pairings. We're like, what? That, that cannot be right. Like, did the tournament already start? And then we check the the tournament information page and it says right there, like 9 a.m. Uh, GMT. So, yeah, we realized we were running late. Uh, we we're just hoping we'll make it in time for round two. Because, uh, yeah, this weekend just cannot keep getting any worse. Uh, we, the place we are supposed to switch from one bus to another, it has the other bus running late, so we are just considering calling an Uber. I do call an Uber, but then we see a bus finally arrive, the one that's running late, like, ah, oh, fuck it, cancel the Uber. Uh, we're taking the the bus, and we get there at, like, 9.40, I don't know. Uh, luckily, round one has not started exactly at 9 a.m., it started, like, 9.20ish, so the timer for the round is still running. We only get the round one loss. The only thing we don't get immediately is the participation pricing, which we have to like. We didn't know it was being distributed at the start of round one, so we are we get it for round round three or something. We have to talk to the judges about that. But yeah, we get there. We all start with a round one loss. Not uh, not the place you want to be. Uh, as Christian said, I think at some point earlier, uh, the losses that you can afford to variance are very few, and the later they are, the better. Because it will significantly affect your tiebreakers if you lose early. Because you're going to play against the person that's 0-1. And then you're going to play against the person that's 1-1. Assuming you keep winning. Then the person that's 2-1. A person that's 3-1. And so on. If you keep winning, it's still going to be players who initially lost. And are more likely to keep a losing later. Uh, which will have a very negative impact on your on your first tiebreaker. Which is opponent's match win rate. And by extension, all the other tiebreakers as well. So yeah, starting with a round one loss is just rough. And then, for me in particular, round two I pair him into a mirror against the newer player on Sakazuki. But he's like decently comp... Like, he, he's like an alright player. Like, he, he didn't make the perfect plays, but he knew what to do. And yeah, he had two Moria's, one Rebecca... Uh, two Moria's, two Rebecca's, I had one Moria, one Rebecca. And I could not find a way out of the game besides trying to all in. And I lost... Uh, so yeah, I just started zero two, 2 and that was already, like, my head was steaming. Yeah, and you're basically out of the tournament. The, the, that's what I'm saying. If we had more rounds, even with O2, you can still probably claw back into the <coughs> game. However, with this kind of tournament format, uh, you're basically, your tournament is over. Yeah, um, and obviously, even if I kept winning, which I didn't, I had uh, another two losses. In matchup, which I usually don't lose, but obviously not, not my weekend, so I lost those as well. But even if I kept winning, my tiebreakers would have sucked. Like, the, the person that I effectively gave a bye to round one didn't do well. The person I lost to round two, I think, dropped by round five with one four or two three score. They did do real well in the side of it, though, so I'm pretty sure they probably just left the tournament without dropping, so it took some time for judges to notice. At least that's my head count. Uh, and yeah, there's just like, you encounter opponents who just kept losing early rounds and your tiebreakers are just going to be destroyed. But yeah, it is what it is. Uh, it was a lot of lessons learned and it's not where the weekend ends. We still had to like get back to Croatia and play the side event actually on Sunday, which I also didn't really do well in. Uh, I guess I can do a quick summary of the event. Actually, let me pull up Limitless just because... Uh, I guess you, you. It's nice to be transparent with the losses as well, because you yeah, don't yeah. always succeed. Like, n no matter how good you are, sometimes stuff just won't go your way. So let me just go over the. How do I see my? Oh yeah, I... yeah. The, the, we really have to preface this to to our listeners. Uh, I keep saying this. We we do this full time. We spend a lot of time with the game. I think it's 
quite objective to say that both of us are very good players. We will trust trust us. We will not perform on every tournament. It's simply impossible. The there's variants uh, in the game. There are matchups. Sometimes you, if you get matched up like five times in a row with your worst matchup, like losing one of those games is quite possible. Um, and um, being a good player will not always translate to results. But yeah, it, you can expect at least a decent showing. Yeah, and the, the nice thing about One Piece TCG is even if you don't succeed the first time, as long as you have more events and you perform consistently, eventually you will be rewarded just because the pricing is compared to other games so rich. Uh, but yeah, in any case, for a short tournament report... Oh yeah, one thing uh, I don't like that organized play events do, the, the host for this event, the tournament organizer, on Limitless, uh, they set people's names to nicknames. And I don't know people by their, by their nicknames. I know most of the One Piece players. I, the local ones I know by their nicknames, but all the foreign ones I know by their actual names. So, And I would like to know them by their actual names when I sit across someone new. Uh, and yeah, they use nicknames on Limitless, and that's just... I have no idea who I played against looking at, at this list. In any case, yeah, round one, no show loss. Round two, Sakazuki Mirror, where I got outgrinded due to some power card differential. Round three was NL. Uh, I think NL is like a near unlosable for Sakazuki in this format. It, it wasn't very eventful. I, I think I only had one Moria, but I could be wrong. I, I might have more Morias. In any case, anything he played, I cleared. He had like Yamato, Yamato, Yamato. It didn't matter. Like, he just cleared it all. Uh, worth noting, I was playing the Great Eruption and Ice Age list, so I, I was sticking to the to what already worked for me, mainly because in testing the stage list did not seem that much stronger. Uh, but I'll get to that later. Uh, round four was a Yamato. Uh, once again, I think that deck is like generally aggro strategies. I don't think are really good into Sakazuki just because now he has eight searchers for two Ks. He has. Uh, eight cards that recur, two Ks, and the four Rebecca's and the four Morias that get back Rebecca's, and also play a searcher, so you possibly find two K two two Ks of a one card. So yeah, uh, beat the Yamato pretty handily. Uh, then it was a Katakuri, which had some insane triggers, uh, especially towards the end game. So I had to go all in. Uh, I think it was a pretty safe all in at that point, though. So I won. Round six was another Yamato, and once again, it wasn't a very uh, challenging match just because I think Sakazuki is decently favored into Yamato when played uh, when played well. And then round seven was against a guy who said, "I haven't played the game much. I just borrowed Katakuri from from my uh, friends." And you can see where this goes. Uh, what happened was I was Daryl. He goes second. He plays two pudding. I have nothing on one, nothing on three. I play Kuzan on five. But at this point, he already like his six was. Sorry. His it's four. four was playing on Nami, swinging to banish my life, which he does. I'm not going to defend an 8k banish. I play Kuzan, then his turn is uh, 5 with Onami, 5 with Pudding, 7 with Leader, which already starts draining my hand. That's the most annoying uh, Katakuri strategy to face because they're not playing cards from hand, they're not giving up cards from hand. And since I have no small bodies to deal with his like uh, little things, and I didn't have a Robuchi, I just start getting chipped down relentlessly. And that keeps up, I just uh, get attacked over and over again by those puddings, and uh, I am not able to clear them fast, and eventually he just starts chaining 10 cost moms, and I lose. It was... Yeah, when, when you have no early start, no good early start against Katakuri, game can get very rough very easily. Worth noting, I don't play Sabo, so I don't have the backup plan. I usually always count on my deck being better and more consistent. And disrespect Yellow, don't play Sabo. Uh, I still think that's correct. And it has worked for me throughout the entirety of OPO5 and OPO6 so far. But, you know, some days it will fail as a strategy. And perhaps it's good that it was that day rather than some other. Then I played against another Katakuri. This is where I saw my cards, so I won pretty handily. Because, yeah... My dad, Sakazuki is a better deck. But then I played against another Katakuri, and another similar thing happened. Uh, I did have searchers this time, uh, but I had very little counters and no blockers. So I won Dyro. 
but I died on his nine dawn. He went to reject Amar on nine dawn, and I died because in my eight or nine cards in hand, I had like four K counters, so it was just uh, absurdly, absurdly unlucky to to reach that point. But I was like, I would make peace with the fact that it's not my day. So I didn't. I don't. Well, once I get tilted, I just stop caring. Like Christian probably knows this. Once I'm tilted, I just make peace with the fact. Okay, whatever happens, happens. It's I'm not going to lose sleep over it. And then last round, I played against a friend on Gekko Moria. Uh, and I had three Gekko Moria characters as Sakazuki, so I won rather uh, filthily, I think. A final placement was something awful, like 197. <coughs> but, but it was ahead of Fabian. He was 198. So, as I said in my tweet, it's the small victories. Obviously, Fabian also saw the humor in that. We are good friends. Oh, then I played the side event on Sunday. This time we made sure to get to the venue on time. Uh, the side event did start at 10 a.m. though. So, did the other way around, guys. Uh, this time I decided to play stage Sakazuki just because, yeah, I figured might as well. Uh, I tested both lists. It would suck to not have experience on serious tournaments with, with both as serious a side event can be. Uh, round one I played against the Gekko Moria and he won the role, he made me go first, but I just was able to clear everything. The stage list performs naturally better into Gekko Moria because you have more bottom decks, so you just drain him of his options. Uh, round two was against Yamato. Same story, like... Actually, no, this, this was, I think, Fortress Yamato. Yeah, this was Fortress Yamato and he was defending his life rather heavily. Uh, but Fortress Yamato is an even easier matchup than the aggro version, so yeah, it was very much a non-game. Uh, round 3 was against Reiju, and that was actually some guy, I, I can't remember if he said he lives in Austria or Italy or uh, or Germany, he has an Italian name, but he is his parents are either, Cre I think he said Croatian, so we talked a bit in Croatian, uh, real nice guy. Uh, Uka. Uh he played Reiju, but with the stage list, he didn't really see a lot of the the big guys. So the ones that he did see and play out through through the small rangers, I just bottom decked, and then when he when he got to the judge play, he actually only had I think uh, the Reiju to upgrade into, and then she drew into the Ichiji. So I was already in such a commanding position from from that. I even made the slight misplay, I remember. I, I discarded the Hina before before playing Tashigi to maybe find the lightsaber, uh, which I did find, so I was my clear was less efficient. But yeah, I, I won the game pretty handily. And then I played against uh, Amir, which... I'm trying to remember if I won or was the die roll, but that uh, was the game. It was uh, very much a long game, if I remember correctly. Uh... I'm trying to not mix up the two, the two matches, but my my options were like way way worse. Yeah, I th think that was the one. Then round five, I played against uh, Whitebeard, which is like very similar philosophy to Yamato. He's a bit more resilient to just uh, getting killed because he ha he runs a lot of defensive events. But in any case, it was just uh, he plays something. If it has rush, it attacks. If it doesn't, I I clear it before it does anything. Uh, I cleared his small guys with Tashigi. That's like such a nice thing now. You can play Tashigi going first, and they play Nami, and then if they attack with the Nami. You don't have to use leader to attack into it. You just swing the Tashigi. Like you didn't have to see the brand new either to guarantee. It. So I found the Kuzan. I just cleared everything he played. It was rather routine. And then round six was another mirror. And this was a much closer game, but ultimately this was actually a recurring topic. Like people draw a ton of 2Ks against me. Like I, I thought I would be able to, like if, if he clears my board, like the, the big stuff, I would be able to, to just go for game because there was a ton of 2Ks in his grave already. But I swing 7K, he gives me 2K, 1K. I'm like, hmm. Swing 5, gives me a 2k. Swing 5, another 2k. I'm like, okay, now I, now I can just not kill him because he defended too many attacks. 4k, 
from what I expected to be a rather counter counterless hand. So I tried to set up some defense, but uh, I get home blazed and uh, it was actually a flesh and blood player. Um, I wish I could see his name so I could look him up in in flesh and blood. But uh, yeah, it was nice seeing somebody from from uh, flesh and blood with a uh, flesh and blood play map also playing uh, in a one piece event. Oh, always nice seeing people who perhaps you did already meet, but also in context of other card games. Uh, and yeah, then we our plan to get back was once again the painful travel to London with bus, where we just spent the whole day sightseeing. We visited the Bandai Namco store as well, played some games there. Uh, one thing I will say about that one though, pretty much everything regarding the gachas, the gacha pawns, is like three or four times more expensive than it was in Japan. Like, I think it was six pounds for one for one of these. Like, they have the machine where you can get, like... Let me see if I can show it on camera. Uh, I, ha I got the full set in Japan. There's, like, these little admirals. Uh, and I believe in Japan it was, like, 500 yen to roll with these and get one of these, which is three euros. Yeah, I think it's, like, three euros. In London, it was like six pounds for a single roll, so very much not, not worth it. And it had a lower selection of uh, stuff in general and less clogging, so it was still nice to see. It, it's in in the tar in the tourist. I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's like a tourist neighborhood in north western London. Uh, in any case, yeah, it was a fun place to be. We already we also went to see some stuff that we already saw because we were in London on previous occasions for other car games. I think Yu-Gi-Oh! had YCSs there. Uh, and yeah, then we headed to the airport and then from the airport we flew to... Uh, tomorrow we flew from Tupua, which is like in Istria. And then we took the bus from there to Zagreb. Because once again, flying direct, directly to Zagreb on Easter weekend would have been super insanely expensive and we were cheap. Uh, and that concluded the adventure of the Weekend of Hell. The misadventures. Hope, yeah, we'll call it whatever you want. It was not the most fun thing to experience. Uh, for me personally, I'm just happy to finally be home and know I will be home for the next several weeks because I will leave the country in like two weeks for Niagara Falls Regional in Canada. But just knowing uh, I'll be you know, living a normal life for, for a while... Uh, feels refreshing. Finally get to catch up with some uh, content creation that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, put up more of this stuff. And uh, yeah. Uh, just feels nice to be home after a long, long while. Um, okay. And with that, we will conclude uh, today's episode. Uh, thank you for listening to us. Um, from us, you can expect uh, a lot of uh, Patreon content since we things have settled. Uh, my Gekko Moria guide is very close to finishing. We'll be doing our match reviews from Krefeld, which were streamed. Uh, we're going to do Patreon Q&A. Um, we're going to do... Uh, Hro is doing some uh, basic strategy guides, and so on. Like, yeah, and also for the, for our patrons in our Discord, we also will do the the stream here and there where we yeah, just yeah. Uh, whenever we can. Okay, and with that, uh, we bid you farewell, and uh, we'll see you uh, in our next podcast next week. Take care.